So what should you be thinking about before you start fixing up your home? We're gonna delve into this topic today here on Beyond Real Estate. This is our real estate roundup. And this week we have Charles joining us as our guest. He specializes in the space of insurance. So he has a ton of insight within with regards to this topic. And we're also gonna delve into ADUs. And again, what you should know when it comes to valuing your house and how to go about that properly so you don't lose out in that worst case scenario. So stay tuned, you don't wanna miss this one. Join us back soon. Welcome to Beyond Real Estate with Jalik, the podcast discussing parenting, real estate, and business. Every week we go in depth on how to become successful in life and business. Nick, take it away. So how to fix up a property before you sell it. What do we need to be aware of? Because we all have these grand ideas of saying, ooh, I wanna improve this part of my house or that part of my house. Let's first dive into the most expensive part of the house, which is usually that kitchen remodel that so many people want. I'm gonna blame this one on the wives out there predominantly. <laughs> and they want that Charles said $60,000 remodel and say, I want custom cabinets. I want everything whited out and marble. Nope, not marble countertops, granite countertops and not a single sink. I want a double sink and not just a regular sink. It has to be an apron sink. So all of this costs money. And with you occupying the space that you do, what advice do you have for those that are thinking about doing those changes? I think you just described my kitchen remodel. So yeah, <laughs> advice. So, I mean, you gotta think about it this way. You invest $60,000 into your house, especially into something that's gonna add value to your home, which is a kitchen. If you do not update your insurance and say something were to happen, the most crazy thing that would happen would be say a fire, right? entire house burns down and you have to rebuild it. If you didn't update your insurance after you remodeled, that $60,000 that you just invested, you're gonna lose. Basically, you're gonna go to your insurance, you're gonna file a claim, they're gonna give you whatever the amount was for your dwelling that they originally stated. And then they're gonna give you a little bit for like betterments and improvements and a little bit extra just in case it costs a little bit more but it's not gonna cover your $60,000 kitchen that you just heard. So what you really need to do is call your insurance agent or your broker <laughs> and you need to say, hey, I just remodeled my kitchen. This is what we put in. We did tile, we did this, we've done that. And it, it cost me $60,000. So now they'll go back in, they'll go into the what they call the RCT or RCE. And basically they can go ahead and update that your kitchen has been remodeled. It's no longer a regular kitchen, it's now a custom kitchen or a luxury kitchen or whatever it might be, or designer kitchen, depending on, you know, what route you went with. And then they update it and now you're gonna have a higher dwelling. Yes, that's gonna lead to a higher premium, but paying the higher premium to be protected properly, I would say is more important than not, you know, protecting yourself after you just invested $60,000 into it. And that was going to be a, my next question was, but are you telling me I'm going to have to pay more? And there's always that give and take. It's like, you want a nicer kitchen, right? You want that covered in a worst case scenario or not, right? You don't have to, but it's certainly the choice you get to make. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. About Jay or Jay, do you have anything else there pertaining to home improvements? Not home improvements. I mean, when it comes to a lot of things too, if, especially if you're getting ready to sell a house. I would say we're going to have this link below, but there's a great little deal that shows you just a few of the top things that you should be renovating before you sell your home that you'll actually get your money back on. So these are things that whether you're staying or you're going, you know, if you're staying and of course let your insurance agent know so that you can get that better be covered <laughs> for <laughs> what your home is actually worth. A lot of people here in Colorado found that out the hard way in a suburb on the front range. So front range is a uh, flat land. It's not the mountains. It's not a flood zone. And they had a huge fire that wiped out a couple thousand homes. And a lot of those homes had a lot of appreciation. And so to rebuild their home, a lot of the people did not have their insurance rechecked recently. And so they were paying insurance on a home that was a few years, you know, what the value of their home was a few years ago. And so it's like rebuilding your home now, uh, yep. it's going to cost a lot more than that insurance covers. But if you are selling, we have it linked down below. Some of the cool things like garage door, roofing, vinyl siding, just getting those smaller things updated, those renovations, make a house look pretty. I have a great story that we'll talk about in a little bit with insurance. We'll include insurance in that as well, because insurance was a big part while me and my family are looking for our home. But yeah, those are the 
types of things that you should consider while renovating, especially if you're going to sell, does it make sense to renovate that one particular aspect versus, you know, some more important areas of your home first. Just touching on the whole renovation part. I mean, as a, as a buyer, if you're going in to buy a home, the four things that you definitely five, maybe five things that you want to make sure is your roof has been updated recently. I always, you know, recommend five years, your heating, plumbing, your electrical, and then as well as like you said, the vinyl siding or stucco or whatever it might be around your house. As long as those things are taken care of, usually your insurance is going to, it'll be a little bit lower than say someone who has a 10 year old roof or dilapidated siding, or you've got old plumbing or old fuses or things like that. Not into the electrical. Yeah, not into <laughs> the like You're never going to, not never going to find insurance, but it's going to be hard or really expensive. And that's usually what we're trying to avoid. So those would be the that things that if they're updated as a buyer, that's what you want to jump. So sellers take note of that. Those are the things that you can entice more buyers to by going down that checklist being like, we already got all this done. If you're thinking I need to sell my home, go down that checklist right there and be like, have I updated all of these within the last five years? Do they look good? Is there, you know, pieces of my siding missing? I should probably get that fixed before I put the house on the market. <laughs> yeah. And we always hear too, customers or clients call in and we'll say, well, it's a 30 year roof. And it's like, there's no such thing as a 30 year. Like. The insurance carriers want to see a roof done every 20 years. So there's really no such thing as a 30 year roof now or a lifetime roof or so on. Is it possible that the tiles and the, that those things last a long time? Absolutely. But the stuff underneath it may not. That's kind of where it leads to. You want to make sure that your roof is protected, sealed, and you're not getting it. Makes sense. J Jay mentioned this term a little bit ago and that it was the appreciation that homes have had. Charles, let's go down that rabbit hole with the amount of appreciation, with the cost to build having also gone up with appreciation, not necessarily hand in hand. Speak to us, tell us a little bit more about what people need to know specifically pertaining to the last three-ish years for homes. Yeah, owners. so just, so there's a couple of things. Just because the home value has gone up doesn't always mean that your dwelling coverage has to go up, but in the last few years, what has happened is basically we dealt with the pandemic. The pandemic led to a shortage of wood, materials, those things, which skyrocketed those prices. So now basically the cost of wood, the cost of labor, the cost to do things is a lot higher than it used to be. And so your dwelling basically coverage needs to be where it's at currently, not where it was at last year or the year before that, because say the year before that, you might've been at 200, $230 a square foot to rebuild. But now you really need to be at maybe three to 350 just because of the cost of labor and the cost of material. And not to there include you go. that, I mean, you got <laughs> inflation. I mean, yeah. So, unfortunately. So who do homeowners need to lean on when it comes to making sure that's updated? Should they assume that, hey, my insurance carrier is just going to pass that on accordingly on a year to year or? Yeah, so most carriers will do an update on your dwelling every year, but what you really want to do is have them, re like basically have your agent or your broker relook at your coverages, make sure that your dwelling coverage is adequate for the amount of square footage you have in your home. And then two, you probably want to add what we call extended replacement cost. So most people, when they own a home, they'll get extended replacement cost of 25%. So that's 25% of dwelling right? So if it was a hundred thousand dollars, you'd get 20,000. But what you really want is 50% dwelling. So that way, if for whatever reason, we have another inflation year, that's 6%. And in the middle of that year, your policy didn't increase your dwelling. You would have that extra 50% there of your dwelling aid to cover any of those extra costs. Okay. And then there is another coverage, which is called ordinance or law. So for us in California, we always have a lot of new ordinances or laws pertaining to earthquakes or fires. Basically any home that's being rebuilt can no longer have a fireplace. They have to have fire sprinklers. They have to have like all, like there's a lot of stuff here in California that you have to kind of follow and your ordinance or law will help cover that. So if your house did burn down, 
you would want your ordinance or law to be higher than 10%. I think I have mine currently at 20%, which is basically if my house were to burn down, that 20% of my dwelling A is specifically for the ordinance or law coverage. So that I don't have to worry about my whole dwelling A covering all of the new things that I have to do. That's separate. That'll be covered <laughs> over here by this company. And that's kind of nice to have. Okay. He didn't need another reason to not move to California. We're just giving them to you here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Nick knows I, I hate most of the country as far as to live there, you know, Especially find people Dakotas. all around. Oh yeah. The Dakotas are completely useless. That is, <laughs> I'll take that to the grave. Let's jump into a third point here. And you alluded to dwelling space quite a bit. Additional dwelling unit, ADUs. This is something that's very popular in the California as a state of the whole based on recent laws that have been passed to make it more just easier to build ADUs, also known as granny flats. Tell us a little bit more about that from an insurance standpoint, because number one, I know that cannot be used as square footage when appraising a home because it's just an accessory, right? Uh, so it depends on how you build your ADU so that you have in California, you have at least two options. Now you build it in the back of your house on your current property or you build it in the back of your house and you get a separate address. If it's a separate address, it's a completely separate dwelling unit and that square footage is its own, right? In insurance, if you're just building it in the back of your home and it's gonna be you're utilizing your same current address, you wanna make sure that your other coverages or your other structures is higher. So you can imagine you put $100,000 into a granny flat in the back of your house and you're gonna start renting it out to other people and your other structures on your property, maybe only 35,000. You just put $100,000 into other structures on your property. You're not covered for that. Yeah. <laughs> if your tenant burns down your 80, you're not covered, especially if they don't have a renter's policy. And as long if you're not protecting yourself for the money that you invest, you're just going to, I don't know. It's, it's just not smart. Yeah. <laughs> Protect yourself, you know? Check your assets, protect yourself. If you're investing that much money into the house, be prepared to increase your insurance and increase your premiums. Makes sense. Now, and so I want to hear your take on this. And this seller is probably did everything wrong. I, so I was going to buy a house, right? Still looking for a house, but we didn't go with the first house. And I'll tell you why. First thing, it's a mountain house. We love the mountains. We're mountain people. We're hardy people here in Colorado. Hardier up in the mountains. And when it came to this house, beautiful fifties house, had a cabin on it. Who doesn't love that? You can put your mother-in-law in there. No, I'm just, I love my mother-in-law. That wouldn't have been okay. But besides from it being a fifties mountain house, it was in a fire zone. So first thing, second thing, it was next to a Creek. And so it needed flood insurance as well. So fire flood didn't have some siding. Some siding was missing. The foundation was shot. It was, you know, this foundation shot because of the stream because they didn't have gutters on this house. And so all of the water, it's at the base of a hill. And so all of the water <laughs> from this hill would just come right onto the house yeah. with no water mitigation at all. And so this guy can probably not even give away this house at this point. Cause you're looking at, you know, the insurance person we talked to is like just regular insurance is going to be hard on that. So when someone faces something like that, say you're buying in some more remote areas, mountainous areas, fire, flood, what are some things that people should take into account, whether you're buying or selling? Because I think that's something that sure it hits a smaller portion of the population, but it's still that conversation that, you know, can be surprising when you actually get up there and you're like, my insurance is much higher than what it would be if I was just in a suburb. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I would think from the seller perspective, they should definitely let the buyers or potential buyers know what insurances would be needed. Just did a house here in California that happened to be in a fire flood, basically same situation as you kind of nice house, very nice house, but they were told by their realtor that these are the insurances that they would need. They would have to go to the California fair plan. So basically state plan, they would have to do a, what they call as a DIC which is a difference in conditions policy. So that covers basically anything that's not fire or flood related. Then they had to do a flood policy. So they had to have all three of those in order to purchase the house. That was just to get the loan to purchase the house. And 
they were made aware. So that was really helpful for me. I've also dealt with it where the client's not made aware and I get the client calling and they're super excited. And they're like, yeah, I found this $1.5 million home here. And they give me the address and it's, yeah, okay. You know, you're in the mountains, right? Well, yeah, that shouldn't be a problem. Like, okay, you know, there's brush, right? Like, no, that, that's not going to be a problem. And it's like, just some weeds, <laughs> minor weeds. <laughs> yeah. So I could go through all of my carriers and I work with like a lot. I have about 30 different carriers that I work with. They all decline. And so the only option is to go to this California fair plan and do that with the DIC. And then by the time they figure out that cost is going to be crazy, they're like, yeah, you know what? We decided not to buy the house. So <laughs> Understandable. They know these things before purchasing these properties. Then, you know, I, I think they would be a little bit more either hesitant of doing it, or they would actually have enough knowledge of going, okay, I, I know I'm going to be paying a lot for these properties. Yep. So. Yeah, Carlos, do you get listing agents calling you to see, you know, what insurances are necessary before listing a house? I know home inspections are very much, I don't so, even want to call those a norm, but yeah. So, not necessarily, but what I, what happens is say, and I've done this with other agents, basically they'll call in and they just want to know, like some of the things that maybe the seller's agent isn't saying or talking about. So I can pull it up and I'll be able to say, okay, what year are they telling you the roof was done? Okay. I can show here that there's been no roof up or I can see here that there's been this or there there's been that. I can't see if there's been claims or anything like that on a policy, but you can tell typically if roof has been redone because those things are typically reported to your insurance, you know, company, and then those are reported to basically a national database. And so that updates and tells you, okay, this is the last time the roof has been repaired. Any other major systems besides the roof? So sometimes you can see heating, air, plumbing, and electrical, but that's not a guarantee. If they have solar, usually the electrical and all that has been updated. So that'll populate. And then, like I said, the roof is the one that usually populates. Plumbing and heating and air typically don't populate. But usually I would say, I mean, depending on the age of the home, you're probably not going to be dealing with plumbing or I would say heating or air issues because most of the time people would have updated their air. AC is usually like every 10 years, 15 years, at, at maybe 20 years, depending on what kind of unit you have. And usually at that time, people replace the furnace. So those are kind of kind of things that typically happen throughout, you know, the home, I guess, or home living process or owning a home. So those are usually things that pop up, but the roof and the electrical typically. Okay. So that's all important stuff for buyers and sellers out there that are looking to, you know, Hey, I'm looking to buy, sell. What do I check for? What do I look for? All those things that Charles just named off are going to be the things that you can say, Hey, I'm willing to deal with an old furnace, you know, who cares But at the end of the day, it's like, you're going to have to replace it at the end. Yeah. Of it. yeah. <laughs> and it's not good. And I was going to say, I mean, I helped someone not that long ago and basically they were looking at a property and it was like, if you want insurance, when you buy the home, you have to redo the roof. Like, sorry, that's just, what's going to have to happen. No, one's going to give you insurance right now with the condition of the roof. Like basically. Wow we would have had to do a policy where we exclude the roof. And that's, I mean, that sucks. Cause right, like that's a big part of your home, mm -hmm. your entire house. <laughs> and you can think too, I mean, if it's damaged and pieces are falling off, things like that, you have Amazon or UPS delivering and something falls and hits that person, you're liable. So the insurance carriers don't want dilapidated roofs. They want yep. roofs that are new five years or brand new or newer. Yeah. So on, on all that too, I mean, when you're thinking of selling, buying, that's the list to go down. If you're selling, make sure all those things are good. Don't just put on a new coat of paint and be like, yeah, it looks great inside. I mean, the whole thing could crumble at any point in time, <laughs> but it looks amazing. The gains, you know, down in Texas, what is uh, fix and flip, whatever the, the house show is chip and Joanna gains. They would be proud of what I've done on the interior. There's more to it than that. And if you want to see some of those things. Again, we have the resources down below. So everyone out there, thank you for joining us on this Wednesday. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Beyond Real Estate with our real estate roundup here with Charles. Let us know what you think though. Let us know if there are other things that you think we missed and just what your thoughts are because I feel like this 
definitely resonated probably with both buyers and sellers uh, for those of you listening out there. So if this did resonate with any of you, if you tap the like button and even better yet, that subscribe button. So algorithmically, we can connect with just more like-minded individuals out there and help more people at the end of the day. Until next week, this is this week. Thanks for tuning in. Catch you later. Algorithmically. That's Algorithmically. A lot of, yeah, that's yeah. Tough. That was a tough one. It's a, a lot of syllables for <laughs> us. <laughs> this, our show's not <laughs> built for that big of word. Hey, thanks again for listening. If you want to hear more of Jalen McKenna, Colorado's mortgage dad, and his take on the Colorado real estate market or just mortgages and mortgage news in general, check out the links below. Also, check out the links below for more information on products, books, or references made in this podcast. And please don't forget to subscribe, like, and share.